Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Ned Bellavance, Ned1313 on Twitter, and welcome to the Daily Check-In for November 19th, 2020. It's Thursday. That means it's Home Lab Thursday, and we're going to be doing some pixie boot down at the Homeland Ranch. Home Lab? Homeland? Wow. Whew. Accents. I shouldn't do them, and neither should you. <laughs> well, I don't know about you, but I probably shouldn't because I'm not good at them. But the point is, we're going to be laying the groundwork for how I want to approach pixie boot in my home lab. That was actually a request from one of the viewers that I start diving into that realm. And that was something that was of interest to them. And I thought I would start at more of a theoretical level and get down into some of the implementation weeds. And then next time I can go into a full pixie boot of both a Raspberry Pi and a virtual machine to kind of show you how that works. And eventually what I'd like to do is get a Pixie boot available for my Raspberry Pis as well as my Raspberry Pi running ESXi. So we'll get there. We'll get there. It's, it's going to take a few steps. But before we do that, just a quick reminder, I have started a Patreon so I can do cool stuff like this that actually takes a lot of time on the back end to set up. If you would like to support me, I definitely appreciate it. it. The link is down in the description. If you can afford it, I'd love it. If not, I totally understand. It's completely optional. You can enjoy these videos for free as long as you want. You know, maybe share and subscribe, whatever you're comfortable with. But I do appreciate all of the support. Let's check in. How you doing? How's Thursday? You getting along okay? You know, we're we're in the latter half of the week. I I enjoy a good Thursday myself. I like the home labbing aspect of what I've been getting into with with uh with all the automation and and now all the networking. Last week I talked about kind of how my home network is progressing, and now this week. We're getting into some more networking stuff, and I am not a networking engineer by any means, but this is kind of cool. I'm enjoying the tinkering. Hopefully you are too, and hopefully you're having a good day. Let's get right down into it and talk about Pixie Boot. Now, before we talk about Pixie Boot, we have to talk about the mechanisms in the background that support this crazy thing. So for starters, what is Pixie Boot? Pixie <laughs> is P-X-E, and it stands for Preboot execution environment. Yes, the X stands for execution. Yes, it should be PEE. -E. Maybe they just didn't want to call it the P protocol. I don't know. <laughs> but Pixie Boot basically means when your device starts up and it has a network card, it can use that network card to reach out and launch a preboot execution environment. Now, why would you do such a thing? Well, there are a few reasons. One is your device that has that network connection has no operating system or persistent storage on it. So what does it do when it boots up? It loads an execution environment from the network. It basically grabs a pre a preboot execution environment, which then loads a kernel, which then loads a more complicated environment. It all sits in memory. And when that device shuts off, poof, it's gone. No persistent storage but it's very useful because you can boot this thing up wherever. And as long as you can get that IP address and get that preboot ex execution environment, it's awesome. You know what uses that? IP, tele IP telephones. <laughs> if you've ever dealt with the mess that is IP telephones, especially in an office, you'll know those things boot up and then pull their configuration through Pixie. So that's one option. The second option is you have a device that has persistent storage, but you need to bootstrap it in some way with an operating system. You don't want to walk around with like a USB key or a CD-ROM or any of that kind of stuff. So what's your option there? Well, you can boot it from the network and then from the network, you can launch an installer for the operating system of your choice. And it could be a pre-built image that gets loaded, something pre-baked. That's pretty useful. And then the third and final option is if you tend to re-image your systems because they have multiple personalities or whatever, a Pixie boot allows you to re-image an existing system with a new operating system or an updated version. If you're trying to do something along the lines of immutable infrastructure where your config gets pulled every time the machine boots up or something, then Pixie's right for you. Okay, so that is what Pixie is good for. Now, how does it work? Well, in order to boot off the network, it needs to connect to the network. And how does it do that? Well, you've heard of the OSI model. And yes, we're going to get into this just a little bit. And like I said, I'm not a networking engineer expert. I got my CCNA and I stopped right there. <laughs> but um, let's see. Let's see if we can figure this out together. I've got my whiteboard here. So when a device boots up, let's say this is 
where's my, uh, there we go. Okay. So this is my little device and it boots up. Now, when it boots up, let's say it has the capability to pixie boot. So it's got a Nick here. This is my little Nick. And my little Nick has what's called a Mac address. Now we're not gonna deal with layer one because layer one is just the copper, but layer two is what the Mac address is for. This is your L2 address. And then we have an IP address. That's your layer three, L3. So if you hear people talking about L2 and L3, there you go. Your MAC address is L2. Your IP address is L3. The two could have a relationship, but might not. Now, when my device boots up, the MAC address is based off of either an actual MAC address of this NIC card or one that's generated. You know, like your iPhone actually regenerates its MAC address on a regular basis, which is confusing to network gear. But so here we go. The MAC address is usually set by the vendor and it has the vendor's ID buried in that MAC address. Now, it has that information when it boots up, but if it wants an IP address, it has to ask for an IP address. And the way that it does that is through a service called DHCP or Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, which is actually a successor to the boot P <laughs> protocol. So if you see boot P, that's an older version, well, not an, old, an older protocol that is supported by DHCP. So if an older client that uses BootP boots up on a network that has DHCP available, it can support that client. But really, most devices manufactured in the last 20 years don't use BootP, they use DHCP. Now, how do they get the address? That is through a process, and you can remember this, this is really easy, just think Dora the Explorer. And Dora the Explorer likes to discover things. So that is the first step is discovery. So what happens is this device here uses its MAC address and sends out a network broadcast on the local segment of the network. So it basically sends a packet out to the address 255, 255, 255, 255. It sends that address out and it's a broadcast address. So it sends it to everything on that local segment of the network. And it basically says, hey, is anybody out there offering DHCP services? And let's say you have a DHCP server here. The DHCP server is going to see that message and then respond back and say, yes, here's an offer. So here is the second part here. So this is the discover. Whee! And then this is the offer stage. So that's the next step is the DHCP server sends an offer. It says, I'm a DHCP server. This is my IP address. This is the address I'd like to offer you. And it's now up to the client to make the next move. Now you might have multiple DHCP servers. I might have another one here. And it's going to hear that same request. And it's also going to make an offer to the client. And this is why the next step is so important. The next step is R and R stands for request. So our client here is going to respond back with a request to use the address that was offered by the DHCP server. And it's gonna respond back to that. It's gonna respond back with a broadcast letting the DHCP servers know which one it's selected to make that request. And then the last part is the acknowledgement phase. The DHCP server that made that initial offer is now going to send one more message back. Oh, I barely have room for it. Acknowledging it. And that's a terrible way of writing acknowledge, but my handwriting's awful. And that acknowledgement is when the client actually gets an IP address to use. This supports multiple DHCP servers, and you can also configure your router to relay DHCP requests from one network to another if you don't have a DHCP network on that environment. Now, what does all this have to do with Pixie Boot? That's a great question. Now, what this all has to do with Pixie Boot is let me kind of erase things a little bit here. When this offer happens, the DHCP server doesn't just offer an address, it also includes some other potential services. And one of those services can, in fact, be Pixie Booting. So you can have a separate server here that is a Pixie server, or uh, 
yes, it's basically a Pixie server. It's a pre-boot execution environment server. And it also makes an offer, but just for those Pixie services. And then once this client has an IP address, it can use the information in the offer here to talk to the next stage, which is a TFTP server. TFTP, which is Trivial File Transfer Protocol. It could be the same server as the Pixie boot, as the Pixie server, or it could be a different one. Doesn't matter. What's in this offer is the IP address of the TFTP server where it can go and get the boot file or the boot configuration and boot file to boot up in a Pixie scenario. And it also has the name of the file it needs to pick up. So the Pixie server is doing a decent amount here, but it doesn't have to hand out an address. It's just handing out these additional offer information. And then the client over here takes both offers from the DHCP server and the Pixie server and munges them together and uses it to request the boot file from the TFTP server. And that's how the pre-execution environment gets started up. So that's what you that's what I have to build in my lab. Now, what do I already have in my lab? Well, I already have a DHCP server in my lab. I have a Windows domain controller that's running DNS and is also offering DHCP services on the network that is 10.03.0/24, which is what I can start my clients up on. So I can offer DHCP from here, but I do want a more configurable Pixie boot server than what this server is able to offer. So in order to do that, I'm going to stand up a Pixie server running on Ubuntu that will offer both the Pixie service and the TFTP service on that Ubuntu VM. So I think that's what we're going to do in the next segment in this series is get that Ubuntu server up, get all the necessary services installed and configure the Pixie boot so that we can boot a virtual machine on the same network and get that Pixie boot service. So that'll be next time. That's all I have for today. Hopefully that was informative. Uh, it's one of those things like you learn this at some point and then you forget it because it's not relevant knowledge. But if you are planning on setting up Pixie boot in your home lab, this is all information that's going to be very helpful for you to know. And I hope I've laid it out in a way that is of interest to you. That's all I have for today. Please share and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. And until next time, stay healthy, stay safe out there. Bye for now.